It makes me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker for this very special seminar uh, at our Algorithms and Complexity Seminar. So today's speaker is Sushant Sajdeva, um, who, as you may know, he's a faculty member at the CS Department at the University of Toronto and a Vector Institute affiliate. And he's interested in algorithms and its connections to optimization, machine learning, and statistics. And his research and his recent research as fo focus has been the design of fast algorithm for graph problems. Now, what's very, very great is that today Sushant is going to talk about probably one of the greatest breakthroughs, uh, greatest algorithmic breakthroughs of the past 10 years or more, or even more than that, because finally, after many years of work, people finally have come up with an almost linear time algorithm for maximum flow and other related problems, like even minimum cost flow, which is much more general than that. And, you know, like, it, it, you know, it, we are very happy to have him over to tell us more about, you know, like a, about this result and, you know, like basically how, uh, you know, the ideas behind it and, you know, what, 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 what follows next. Um, also, you know, like I should also mention that, uh, you know, um, aside, except for maximum flow, Sushant, you know, Sushant is not fresh on the scene of fast algorithms. Uh, he has contributed to many very important algorithms that, you know, many of us have been using for a, lo for a long time. So for example, I can mention uh, spectral partitioning, basically his results uh, with Oreki and Vishnoi was something that, you know, basically that was like everyone's to go tool whenever they wanted to use graph partitioning for fast algorithms. So that was, that has been a very important subroutine that people have been using for a long time in algorithms. Also, he worked on, you know, a very simple and elegant algorithm for fast Laplacian solvers. Uh, also, uh, you know, more recently, he worked on designing LP flow. So basically a more general class of uh, more uh, class of solvers for more general flow problems. And again, those have been very important because pe people use them uh, as subroutines for other algorithms, including max flow and min cost flow. So, okay, so with no further ado, we should just let Sushant tell us about his new and amazing result. And yeah, thanks a lot for giving this talk here. Thank you so much, Adrian, for both inviting me and for this very generous introduction. Uh, I am honored to be here to talk to you about our recent work. Uh, let me get started uh, to try to get, get the most out of it. So this is joint work with some wonderful collaborators, Lee, Rasmus, Yang, Richard, and Max. So as I can said, we're working on the classic problem of maximum flow. Hopefully all of us have heard about it. It's a problem that goes back almost 70 years. Here, for example, is a diagram from 1955 where Harris and Ross were formalizing the capacity of the Soviet Union's uh, railway network by trying to formulate it as a flow question. So it's a, it's a classic graph optimization problem. We've been studying it for 70 years, but for a long time, it was not obvious how quickly can you do it? Can you do it in almost linear time? So let me formalize the problem for the purpose of this talk. So we think of, we will work with a directed graph, right? So it's a graph over vertices V and edges E. Let's just think of two special vertices, a source S and a sink T. Then every directed edge has a capacity. This capacity, will denote UE as our capacity. And for, uh, for notation, we will think that the graph has M edges, N vertices, and capacities that are integral between zero and U. This will allow us to state our running times uh, more conveniently. Okay, and how do we want to think of flow? So classically, folk, uh, flow has been thought of as a combination of paths from the source to the sink. But a more modern perspective to think about flow is that you want to assign real numbers to each of the edges, okay? So for example, uh, these, these numbers in purple are indicating the amount of flow on that edge. And if I think of flow as a real vector on the edges, I should interpret the value, these purple values as flow flowing along the direction of the edge. And the value gives me the amount of flow flowing along the edge, right? And our goal in maximum flow is to send 
maximum amount of flow from the source to the sink, right? Uh, but you can't send any flow. We have constraints. What, what are the constraints we have? Well, you need to satisfy the capacity constraints. That means the flow on each edge needs to satisfy two conditions. One, it is flowing in the direction of the edge. Right, so Fe each the the real values Fe should be non-negative, right? And remember, our edges are directed. So, for example, all the three edges, uh, for out outgoing from S, it, they must have flow that is outgoing from S, right? With positive, which is indicated by positive values, positive flow values on these edges. Moreover, every edge we said has a, a capacity Ue. That's the maximum amount of flow that you can send on that edge, right? This is a classic uh, max flow formulation. So I didn't completely specify the constraints on the flow problem uh, because all I've said is route maximum flow uh, subject to the capacity constraints. What does it mean for it to be a flow? Well, we need to look at flow conservation on each vertex, all of these vertices, right? So let me formalize it slightly differently from the uh, classic approach. So we'll add one special edge back from the sink T all the way back to the source S. And let me call this edge E sharp, okay? If I route the flow, you know, uh, I have some flow going from the source to the sink in the graph. If I route that back from the sink to the source, then that ensures that I can formulate the maximum flow problem. I will sort of re, you know, the question can be equivalently formulated as, I want to route the maximum flow on this special edge E sharp while respecting demand constraints on every vertex. What is the demand constraint? That every single vertex, including the source and the sink, have incoming flow equals outgoing flow, right? Uh, I should uh, I should reiterate. Please stop me if you have questions. Uh, I'm happy to take questions at any time, right? Happy to answer them. Uh, and my goal is to have uh, all of us follow along for as long as possible. So please stop me for questions. Super. So so this is. This is the maximum flow formulation that will be convenient for us. You want flow that respects directions, capacity constraints, demand constraints on every vertex, and subject to these constraints, you want to maximize the amount of flow on the special edge F E sharp. As many of you probably already know, this is very naturally captured as a linear program, right? Uh, what is the linear program? Well, here, so our goal is to maximize the flow on Fe sharp. I will write that for convenience as minimize minus Fe sharp, right? And we have, we have the direction and the capacity constraints on the flow vector and the demand constraints. So the capacity and direction constraints are easy to write. The demand constraints, uh, let's just take a second to read this constraint saying that for every vertex X, so fix a vertex X, for every vertex X, the incoming flow at X, that's given by this, uh, the second term. Oh, sorry, I should have, <laughs> let me, for, for a fixed vertex X, the outgoing flow, that's the first term, minus the incoming flow at X. When you, when you take this net flow, it's equal to some pre-specified net demand, which for maximum flow was just zero, right? Every vertex had a net demand of zero. Are we all happy with this uh, formulation for max flow, right? Any questions? Okay, super. So, so, so thinking of max flow as a linear program will be convenient for us. And let me just state my uh, result here. Uh, so as I said, this is a linear program. I'll just capture the demand constraints uh, compactly as saying it 
it's 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 represented by the matrix edge word which is called the edge vertex incidence matrix it says b transpose times the flow vector equals a known quantity which is the net demand at every vertex for the purposes of this talk you can just think of d as the all zeros vector right so for this uh, so we show that you can actually solve maximum flow exactly in almost linear time uh, and the dependence on the capacities is polylogarithmic but again for convenience you can think of this capacity u maximum capacity u as being polynomial so this will give you an almost linear time algorithm for maximum flow okay so as the title of the talk mentioned this is not like our result is not just for maximum flow as you can observe i can generalize this maximum flow linear program very easily to a slightly different objective where the objective is now a linear function of the flows okay so i've not changed any of the constraints neither the uh, flow constraints nor the demand constraints i just went from maximizing the flow on a single specific edge to so to minimizing say any linear cost of the flow this is another almost equally famous problem known as min cost flow and our methods directly apply to min cost flow and and we can solve min cost flow again in almost linear time turns out actually min cost flow is like as i just showed it to you is a generalization so it's a more general result uh we can do actually a lot more and i'll just take one slide to tell you the kind all the kinds of problems that we can solve so imagine i wanted to send flow respecting some capacity constraints so my so so look at the constraints that i'm specifying you have directionality capacity and demand constraints all of these are same as in the min cost flow program but the cost how do we measure the cost of the flow has now changed rather than measuring a linear cost of the uh, a linear cost of the flow i'm allowing you to specify different costs on every edge and that cost can be any convex function okay so it's an edge separable convex cost on on the edges and you want to you you are allowed to specify directionality and capacity constraints you are allowed to specify net demand constraints this is what we call as a general convex flow and our framework can be extended to show that you can all solve all of these general convex flows in essentially almost linear time it's under some technical conditions which i will defer uh, for the purposes of the stock uh, but these results are not like we give us a lot of applications and this is i mean it's one of the primary reasons max flow is such a popular problem right we can give so many reductions uh for other interesting problems to maximum flow in particular you can capture uh, bipartite matching min cost flow worker assignment optimal transport uh, it's a it's a hot problem in 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 some sub areas of machine learning today uh diffusion negative weight shortest path all of these achieve almost linear time algorithms via direct reductions from min cost flow but our convex cost flow program also gives us further more problems that you can solve uh, you can now solve weighted p norm flows in almost linear time you can do entropy regularized optimal transport matrix scaling isotonic regression all of these can be formulated as send send some flow and minimize a convex cost and hence we can solve all of them in almost linear time okay is any question about uh, results before i move on to giving you uh, some ideas about how do we approach the problem okay awesome yeah please don't hesitate uh, to stop me uh, and ask a question super so let me spend just one slide comparing two previous works and sort of giving you a brief snapshot of the history on this work it's really impossible to do justice there has been so much work on this problem but i would like to identify 
certain key phases in the history of the maximum flow problem and in some sense draw a contrast of from our works to the previous works. So the first phase in, uh, in, the time, in the history of the maximum flow problem, going back to the first works from Daikin and uh, for Fulkerson, these were combinatorial algorithms for maximum flow. Uh, I assume all of you have seen uh, the augmenting flows algorithm, right? Uh, so we can think of the augmenting flows algorithm as consisting of two pieces. There's an outer loop and an inner loop. Okay, what is the... The inner problem is saying, find me one augmenting flow. Okay, that's what I'm calling the inner problem. And then there's an outer loop that says, oh, you find, uh, find an augmenting flow, compute the residual path and repeat. Find an augmenting flow, oh, sorry, compute the residual graph and repeat, right? That's an outer loop. So the inner problem is augmenting flows, and then there's an outer loop. And it, like this will be convenient for me to talk of the remaining algorithms. So intuitively speaking, until Goldberg and Rao achieved an M to the three halves algorithms, all of these come algorithm sort of work with combinatorial structures to both the inner problem and the outer problem. And after Goldberg and Rao, there was in some sense uh, like progress stalled for some time. Uh, it took a decade until Daich and Spielman in 2008 achieved M to the three apps also for min cost flow, not just max flow. For max flow, they achieved the same bound uh, or maybe even worse, but uh, but they showed that, this, that you could achieve the same bound for min cost flow. But more importantly, they introduced a very, a very key idea, a paradigm shift, if you, you may call it. They introduced the idea of using interior point methods as the outer loop. I'll talk more about interior point methods in detail. This gives you root M outer iterations or better. And another key, uh, key idea they introduced is to use inner problems that are more numerical in nature rather than combinatorial. In particular, Deitch and Spielman were using the idea of L2 flows or electrical flows, as you might have heard them, heard of them uh, as the inner efficient uh, algorithm. So this became what is in some ways called as the Laplacian paradigm, and it led to lots of works making progresses. Uh, on flow problems uh, and, and other graph problems. But to flow problems, for a long time, people made a lot of very interesting progress, starting with Madri, Lee Sitper, Kathuria and Lee Sitper. And they were focusing on improving the interior point method, most of these works. They were focusing on how do you improve this outer algorithm? In the last couple of years, there has been some small but def very interesting progress in making the inner algorithm somewhat faster. We are using dynamic algorithm. But despite the incredible amount of work, if you have a sparse graph, right, like M is roughly N, uh, the fastest algorithms we have run, like, we have before this work ran in time n to the 1.48 uh, if you had polynomial capacities, like really almost close to 1.5, far from linear. So how does our work stand in contrast to this? Um, so we achieve almost linear time. That's something I already mentioned. We combine these pieces in, in a very different way in some sense. So we give a new IPM, that's in some, actually slower than the IPMs being used in all of these works. It requires almost linear number of iterations, but it's a different kind of an IPM. It's an L1 IPM. I will talk more about this piece in detail. This IPM gives rise to actually a combinatorial inner problem. Okay, like it's more combinatorial than formulating electrical flows. And we'll identify this. This uh, The problem is min ratio cycle. I will define it. And finally, we give a dynamic algorithm to solve the entire sequence of combinatorial problems in almost linear time, right? Or every single sub problem is solved very efficiently 
in an almost constant amortized time. Okay, this is this is in some sense a bird's eye view of how our algorithm contrasts with previous works. And in the rest of this talk, I hope to give you explain to you the first piece, the IPM in detail, and give you maybe a couple of ideas about the dynamic algorithm. Okay, shall we dive in? Uh, take a pause for questions if there are any. Yeah. I, I guess your for Fulkerson bound is not exactly, like it's not M for unweighted graphs, right? Ah, uh, that's right. Uh, like it's for M for weighted graphs, do you mean? So for unweighted graphs, graphs, I guess it didn't give a near linear algorithm, right? Uh, for unweighted graphs, it is, it is more efficient. See, I'm I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking at la, polynomially large capacities. So U is giving you what is the capacity on, oh, right. So, sorry, this should not have been MU, this should have been MF. F is the total amount of flow. Okay. Uh, sorry, right, and F, and that could have been M squared U, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not accurately written. Sorry about that. So it should have, it, this should read as M F star, where F star is the total amount of flow uh, that you can send. Thank you, thank you for catching that. Okay, so let, uh, I wanna, like I'm already at 25 minutes, uh, tw the next half an hour is, uh, is short. Let me try to get you some of the most uh, key takeaways from our work. So I'll focus on the first ingredient, which is an L1 interior point method. If you haven't heard about IPMs, don't worry about it. You will not, I will not assume anything uh, in this part of the talk. Okay, so the idea we build on is what is known as a potential reduction IPM. It's, it, so we will start with our, our linear program that I'm just writing on the right here for, for convenience. Uh, we build on the idea of Karmarkar, who gave the first interior point method. It's a, it's a framework for solving linear programs. Here is essentially his algorithm. He wrote down a potential, which was in some sense magical at that point. Uh, the potential consists of two parts. The first part of the potential, so I'm, I'm going to try to visualize both the potential and the algorithm with this small cartoon LP on the right hand side. So this LP has, you know, six sides, six, six hard constraints. Uh, okay. Uh, so the potential, uh, okay. And these uh, contours that you see in this diagram on the right, actually, uh, like I've plotted exactly this function for this uh, linear program. Okay. So you are seeing how the potential is increasing in one direction. So the potential consists of two parts. The first term, which is M times the log of the difference between the optimal flow minus the current, uh, current amount of flow. So I will assume that you know the optimum value. What is the amount of flow that you can send in the network? You can achieve this. We are doing a binary search on the amount of flow. Okay, so the potential consists of two terms. The first one is, is this log of this difference in the objective value, it's a term that tries to improve the objective. And the second term consists of what is called the log barrier. So for every edge, remember the edge has a direction and you want the flow to be non-negative and bounded by the capacity UE. For edge E, I'm going to add the terms log, minus log FE and minus log UE minus FE. These terms force that FE should be non-negative. Remember, minus log FE blows up to infinity as FE goes, vanishes to zero, right? And similarly, it minus log UE minus FE blows up to infinity as FE gets close to the capacity UE. So these log barrier terms keep you far from the boundaries of this polytope that you are optimizing inside. 
Okay, so this potential term, this potential function has two terms. There's one potential that's trying to improve the objective. And there is a term coming from every constraint that is forcing you to stay away from the boundary. Sorry. And yes. Uh, short question. So this opt, uh, I guess you don't know it. Hmm. In the object. Yeah, good. So opt is just the optimum value. You don't, it's not the optimal flow, it's the optimum value. You will guess it. We are doing a binary search. Okay. Right? Yeah. We will we will guess the opt op value. We are doing a binary search. Thank you. Okay. So the amazing idea is that now if if you can find a point with this potential value being small. How small? Just minus m log m. Then observe that the, the function, the second term, this, this term that keeps you away from the boundary is actually bounded below. It's bounded by some constant for every edge. So if the potential is really negative, minus m log m, you can easily conclude that you are in terms of the amount of flow, you are very close to the maximum possible. You, you are inverse polynomially close to the maximum possible, right? So if the opt was uh, like, if opt was the maximum amount of flow, you've already routed opt minus one over M to the hundred, right? And once you're that close to routing the maximum amount of flow, you can just round to get the exact opt. Right. So, th right. So this is the. It's a very interesting piece for this potential function. So that actually gives you what is the high-level algorithm going to look like. We are our goal is to find a point with low potential. So how do we do that? We are going to start with some f zero that's inside this polytope, not on the boundary, inside the polytope, and at every step we'll try to improve its potential by a small amount. So we move from F0 to F1, improving its potential, F1 to F2 and so on. And you keep taking these steps. And at the end, following almost along these con the contours of this potential function, you'll be very close to the optimum. Once you are very close, because we're sort of working in a very nice polytope, you can just round it to the nearest integral point. Any questions? Are we happy with the with this high level picture of what this potential algorithm is going to look like? I'm going to give you more details now, but please stop me if there are questions. Oh, yeah, so maybe a small one. Why yeah. is it easy to round the flow? When you are close uh, to the optimal, you, you say it's easy, we just round Yeah, it. the reason it's easy is because we are working like I, I saw, I said this at the beginning, we are working in the setting where uh, the demands and the capacities are integral. If your demands and the capacities are integral, then you know that the flow solution has to be integral, the optimal flow solution. So if I have a 4.5, for instance, you run to four or to five? But it cannot be 4.5 because you are very close, one over M to the hundred piece. I see. You're, so it will be 4.99999, and then you are sure it must be five, okay. right? So yes, you have to get very close in objective value, but the point is that you can get really, really close, inverse polynomially close to the objective value. Okay, good, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe I have a question. Yes. If you do final research on, on opt, why don't yeah. we have yeah. log u in the running time? Uh, we, we, so I, so I wrote, I, we have a poly log u outside. I, I, in the result, we actually have a poly log u. Yeah, so we have, we have a poly log mu. For convenience, we can think of the u as polynomial, but, uh, but that's only for the stock. In the paper, we actually derive the exact dependencies. It's a log squared mu. One more question. Yes. So do, is this rounding the main barrier to go to general weights? Uh, we can already work with general weights. Uh, what do you mean? You mean general? You mean general convex flows? Sorry, I mean non-integer weights. 
Ah, so so non-integer rates usually the uh, the way to th think about it is suppose I mean for one they are all rational weights, right? If they are all rational weights, then you can scale up the problem so that they all become integral weights, right? And then and the dependency is in only logarithmic in the in logarithmic in those weights finally, right? So, so suppose if my weights were four over five, one over three, then I'll multiply all the weights by 15 and they will become integral. If I can right. ask a question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, when you are doing binary search in order to locate the optimal quantity, that requires that you have access somehow to an oracle, which tells you whether for a particular total flow, value, a flow exists or not. Excellent. Good. Now, I'm curious whether such an oracle is easier than solving the entire problem. Ah, uh, good. Uh, not that I, yeah, I do not know of an oracle that's easier than solving the problem. Right. But you, but you can essentially run, like, assume, uh, like, you guess a value and you run an algorithm. If you if you fail, then you know it's not uh, it's not the optimum value. If you succeed, then uh, then you know maybe there is a higher value, uh, right? So you bounded the value. But you're very right. I do not know of a more efficient way rather than just running a algorithm after guessing the value. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions? Okay, super. But please, I, I welcome these questions. Thank you. Uh, this is like if you if you uh, have a question, many others are also wondering it. So please please stop me and ask a question. Okay, awesome. So here is the here's how you get convert this into an algorithm as Karmarkar did. So what is our goal? Remember, so we are we are starting from a point f zero. You can show that you can, for the flow problem, you can construct a point F0 that has potential bounded by M log M, positive M log M. And from there, you want to finally find a point that has potential smaller than minus M log M, right? That's our goal. So I'm just rewriting our potential here. Karnaka says that what we should try is let's, Taylor expand the second term in this potential, okay? So I should note here that this potential is actually not convex. The first, uh, the second term is convex. The first term sort of makes it concave convex, uh, but uh, we'll ignore this for now. So the second term is convex. You do a Taylor expansion. So that means you approximate it via, we'll only do it for degree two. So approximate it with a second degree polynomial. So to approximate a function with a second degree polynomial, you need to write down its gradient and its Hessian, right? So, so I'll denote the exact gradient of this potential by G symbolically throughout the talk. Uh, and its Hessian, you can write down exactly that the Hessian term for E is one over Fe squared plus one over U minus Fe squared. And with this, you can write so I can write this Hessian approximately up to a factor of two as I like, I sum those terms and put the square outside. So it's one over Fe plus one by one minus U minus, one by U minus Fe squared. Uh, let me denote this quantity Le, Le symbolically for the length of the edge E. Okay, so what is the length of the edge E? It's one over Fe plus one by U minus Fe then that's a definition. So with this gradient and this Hessian approximation, you can write that the potential, so if I'm at a point F and I want to bound the potential at F plus delta, I can upper bound it with the potential at F, that's the first term, plus a linear term given by the gradient inner product of the step, the G transpose delta, plus a quadratic term, which is given as L delta two norm squared. 
So L is given by this diagonal matrix, one over one by Fe plus one by Ue minus Fe. Let me pause here for us to absorb this and happy to take questions. Is this, is this clear to all of us that we are Taylor expanding the second term up to degree two that allows us to write in a neighborhood around F, the phi of F plus delta as phi F plus G transpose delta plus this L delta squared quadratic. I can actually visualize what this is doing. So, so I'm writing some of the key definition on the right in case, in case we need to remember it the definition of L, which is the length and G as the grid. So at F, now here's how the algorithm will proceed. At F, you write the second order approximation and you find a delta that minimizes this upper bound, this quadratic upper bound, okay? And this convert, this gives you what is the usual Karmarkas IPM algorithm it says you want to solve the following sub problem. You want, what is the sub problem? The sub problem says staying within this subspace, uh, you want to find a step delta that does not add any net demand to any vertex. So B transpose delta is zero. So it's a circulation. So it stays within the subspace of all flows satisfying your demands. And you have two, you want to, minimize the ratio of two terms, that's G transpose delta, where G is your gradient, divided by the L2 norm, the length of the vector L delta, where the length of every edge E is given by this term L E. This is the standard Karmarkar IPM. And this problem is essentially electrical flows. And here's how to visualize this algorithm. So say I'm at a current point F inside the polytope. I will, this, this second order Taylor approximation sort of builds an ellipse around the point F defined, whose axes are defined by the length L. In this ellipse, you look at the direction given by the gradient and move to the point at where, where this gradient vector meets the ellipse and that becomes F plus delta. That's that, so if you started with F zero, this F plus delta will become F one. And that's how we'll proceed. So every iteration looks like the following, that you draw this ellipse around the current iteration, you look at the direction given by the gradient, you move as much as possible in that direction, and then you repeat. Yes, is this picture making sense? More yeah, maybe, questions? Yeah, maybe a short question. So, okay, yeah. you have this ellipse, but then you have to enforce this projection. Well, this B transpose delta is equal to zero. So what do you do? You just subtract? Ah, uh, good. So, no, no, this, so you can easily solve this problem inside this entire subspace by solving a linear system. Mm -hmm. And the linear system becomes equivalent to solving computing electrical flows, which is which can be solved efficiently via Laplacian solvers. Right. So, so we will we will end we will compute the exact projection via Laplacian solvers, and that's easy to do. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So so far, this is exactly Karmarka's IPM. I've not shown you any new idea, but now I can show you the first and essential new idea is that we actually write an approximation that's worse. Rather than writing the L2 norm squared, you can upper bound it by a worse quantity, L1 norm squared. And that gives you a different sub problem where now you want to optimize the ratio of G transpose delta to the L1 norm of L delta. This is just the length of the cycle. I will interpret this problem a little more on the next slide, 
so but let me visualize this what does this do inside the polytome so instead of working within the ellipse i will work in inside a smaller l1 norm ball in this ellipse and you will only move to the optimum inside this l1 norm Okay, this like this is our first essential new idea that instead of working with a standard L two IPM, we work with an L one IPM. Okay, and let me so a simpler version of of this IPM that we give was that we discovered after we posted our paper actually appeared in nineteen ninety two. We have several advantages on top of their work, but this essential idea was was already in their paper. So let me spend a slide interpreting this sub problem. This is this problem that we call min ratio cycle. So okay, so so three things: you are looking at the minimum over delta such in this subspace B transpose delta is zero. So what does that mean? That means that delta is a circulation. So at every vertex the net demand is always zero right in particular you can think of delta as a linear combination of cycles in the graph right and what are we optimizing over the subspace we are optimizing the ratio g transpose delta g is your gradient over the length of the cycle l delta so let me visualize this so say if i have a graph for every edge i have a length associated with it le right these are lengths i will write them in red for convenience these are always non negative we also have a gradient associated with every edge these are numbers in black but these gradients have directions right so for example this big edge in the center has a, a gradient of 4 in the direction from left to right what does that mean let, let me try taking an example so say i have a i pick this cycle where in in this in this counter clockwise direction sending one unit of flow along this cycle the length of the cycle is easy to calculate the length is just these numbers in red 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 the length is 6 right what is the gradient contribution you have to be careful in the gradient contribution in the gradient contribution the contribution of each edge changes sign according to whether you flow along the edge or against the edge okay so if i'm moving in the counter clockwise direction then this edge with gradient 4 actually contributes minus 4 because i'm moving opposite to the direction of the grid okay and then i my sum becomes minus 4 Plus one, plus three, plus one. That gives me one. So the gradient of minus one along the direction of an edge means that uh, while the edge oriented towards, you could have. Uh, good, good, good. This is. Let me let me pause. Uh, good question. Thank you. Let me pause here and reiterate. this problem is undirected in the sense that every edge can be traversed in both directions every edge can be traversed in both the forward direction and the backward direction but your gradient contribution changes sign depending on whether you travel along the direction of the gradient or against the direction of the gradient Did that? Did that answer your question? Sorry, I can't see you. So if you can speak up, then. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. Please. This is an essential point. I will reiterate it. This problem is has edges that are undirected and lengths that are undirected. So an edge can be traversed in both direction. The length contribution is the same in both direction. but the gradients are directed the gradients flip sign when you traverse the cycle in the other direction so here i went from counter clockwise to clockwise and the length remains the same 
but the gradient contribution now flips side yeah so so just for this illustration yes. you fixed an arbitrary orientation of the edges and then the gradient is with respect to this arbitrary um, that's it yeah. that's for illustration yes that's it that's it so you can assume there is an arbitrary orientation fixed throughout for just and it's just convention for convention you will fix you will fix an orientation right and it only affects the gradient contribution but you can traverse every edge in either direction right is the sub problem clear to all of us happy to take another question there so the red weights uh, they come from uh, the the second derivative uh, they are like the That's right. of uh, capacity plus they are the square root of the hessian of the uh, function roughly approximately uh, right up to a constant the constant factors will not matter for us so up to they are they come from the second derivative that's right okay. Okay, so let me reiterate the point I made that edges and lengths are undirected. Gradient has a direction. Why did we go to L one? Well, here is, for example, one big reason is now you can assume that the optimal solution actually is a simple cycle in the graph. Right, the structure of the solutions of these. mean ratio cycle problems is much simpler than than the l2 norm flows that previous works were working okay and in some sense that's the that's the big conceptual advantage of this l1 ipr sorry maybe question yeah. of definition what's a simple cycle ah uh, just say uh, like you have to traverse every edge a single time and you send as one unit of flow along all of these edges that's or a subset of the edges but every edge appears at most points okay right it it doesn't look like one on a subset and then two on on the shared edge that's that's not necessary you can assume that the optimal cycle uh, optimal solution can be a simple cycle okay thanks Okay, so let me uh, formalize what did what do we prove? So we give this outer L one IPM algorithm with the following essential properties. First, you have almost linear number of iterations, right? M to the one plus little o one iterations, where each at each iteration the sub problem is a min ratio cycle problem. Okay, two. you don't need to solve these min ratio cycle problems exactly in fact you can solve them very very crudely and m to the little o one approximation at every iteration is sufficient okay three these problems are actually very related to each other in particular my gradients ge and my lens will not change a lot from iteration to iteration over the entire sequence they change a total linear number of times so which means going from iteration i to i plus 1 only a small almost constant number of coordinates in the gradient and lens change right so these are you can think of them as very stable throughout the entire sequence your problems are changing very slightly right and finally for each of these min ratio cycle problems if f is your current solution then the direction to the optimum f star minus f actually is a good certificate in the sense that this gives you a good good solution to the min ratio cycle problem achieving an optimum of negative a constant right are we happy with this uh, uh, this is our outer iteration 
so what so what does this reduce our problem to this reduces our problem to solving a sequence of min ratio cycle problems where that are changing very slowly right and we and our second key contribution will actually be to build a data structure that solves this entire sequence in almost linear time okay so here's like if you want to visualize uh, the overall structure of the algorithm here's how it would look like so we are going to maintain a data structure that will maintain a small collection of trees spanning trees of the graph our algorithm runs in almost linear number of outer iterations at every iteration i will update my gradients and lengths with these gradients and lengths the data structure will update the collection of trees uh, according to these uh, essentially the lens it can even ignore the gradients but we update the collection of trees the our data structure will now identify an approximate solution to the min ratio cycle problem and this solution we'll guarantee also has an efficient representation it's represented as a union of a small number of fundamental cycles in the in the tree like in one of the trees in the calculation so what is a fundamental cycle in a tree if i take a tree i add a single off tree edge if i add a uv off tree edge then the u to v path in the tree along with this off tree edge together gives you one cycle right a unique cycle that's called a fundamental cycle and the solution the approximate solution we identify will actually be the union of a small number of these fundamental cycles so it has an efficient representation with respect to the tree that we are maintaining we can use this representation to efficiently update our existing flow with a small amount of circulation along this uh, along this solution delta and that completes our iteration now you repeat for almost like in the market right is it, we have a sense of the overall structure of the algorithm now questions okay so officially i am at 5 minutes uh, and i with i mean it's not surprising but i will not have a lot of time to give you a full idea of how the data structure works and it's it's a big chunk of the paper but i want to give you one more key idea to take away that is some kind of trees can be good for maintaining for solving these problems approximately so let me start with a cartoon sketch of this problem uh Uh, let me maybe ask uh, Daniel or Adrian. Uh, what is the norm? Should I stop at dot eleven and then and then we take it from there? If a few people want to wait, uh, ask questions or take more. Or... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. You need them. Sorry. How much extra time do you need? I, 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 as as much time as you give me i will i'm happy to stop at 11 and then we'll take it from there as like if your folks want to hear more okay okay so so let me let me show you a cartoon picture of why can you hope to solve these problems efficiently approximately and i will show you that tree embeddings are very useful for solving these problems so what is our goal you are given the gradient g uh lens l and you want to find the approximate win ratio cycle g transpose delta by n delta here will be our algorithm i'm going to sample a random tree is a special kind of trees called low stretch spanning trees but uh, if you don't know them don't worry i will tell you what they do i will sample such a tree that you can do this in almost linear time and then i will check all the fundamental cycles in the tree there are m at most m fundamental cycles you check all of them you check all of their ratios and return the best one 
Okay, you can also do this computation in almost linear time. So it's an almost linear time algorithm, much slower than what we need, but it's uh, but uh, still it's almost linear time. I want to show you that this algorithm returns and a fundamental cycle that is a good approximation. Okay, let me show you that. So here's the claim that some fundamental cycle in the tree is a polylog approximation with at least with probability half. Okay, and what is the key idea? The key idea is low stretch trees preserve lengths. Okay, so the guarantee that these low stretch tree distributions give you that the length of a fixed fundamental cycle is only a polylog factor times larger than the length of the off tree edge, right? So, what is a so recall? What is a fundamental cycle? One off tree edge plus tree path. Low stress trees say that this tree path is not much larger than the off tree edge, but it's not true for every off tree edge. It's true in expectation over this distribution over trees. Okay, it cannot be true for all cycles, but it's true in expectation. So if it's true in expectation, I can add, let's say delta, I had my optimal solution delta star, then adding this guarantee of the low of tree, guarantee over the path, uh, guarantee over the tree paths corresponding to the off tree edges in delta star, and applying Markov, you get that if you sum up the lengths of these fundamental cycles corresponding to the edges in the optimal solution, they are not stretched by a big factor with constant probability, right? With half probability, if I looked at all the fundamental cycles corresponding to this optimal solution, they, their length is essentially the same as the length of delta star. Yes, what did I do? I just added the guarantee over all edges in delta star and you applied Markov's inequality. So with constant probability, you are not uh, constant, you're not more than two times the expectation. Okay, that's the first part. The second key part is that actually, if you look at all fundamental cycles, the total gradient contribution of these fundamental cycles is the same as the gradient contribution of the of delta star. Okay, let me visualize this. So look at look at delta star on the left. It consists of three edges: blue, purple, and green. So for the blue edge, uh, the first tree on the right shows you what is the fundamental cycle in the tree, right? And then similarly, the purple cycle and the green cycle. If I sum up the gradient contributions across all the three cycles, note that every tree edge appears exactly twice. Once in one direction, the other time in the opposite direction. So their gradient contributions exactly cancel. Right, so now I have a few fundamental cycles where the sum of their gradient contributions is the same as the gradient contribution of delta star, and the sum of their lengths is not much larger, at most a polylog factor larger. This means you can do a simple averaging argument to show that there exists at least one of these fundamental cycles that's a polylog approximation. Yeah, okay. I think that is the only essential idea I can give you in the time I had. Maybe I should have tried better. Uh, but from here, what you need to do is you need to maintain these low stretch embeddings throughout the sequence of problems, right? As G and L change, remember a, a low stretch embedding depends on the length cell, right? Like this Markov that you applied it depends on the lens cell. So you need to keep changing these embeddings 
as these gradients and lengths change, and you need to be able to find uh, this fundamental cycle efficiently. We are able to do that. I will love to take another hour to talk about it, but let me, uh, let me stop. Uh, for, for the experts in the audience, I will say just a few words. Um, the data structure is built on trying to sort of do J trees, uh, J trees from Madhuri in a dynamic structure. What does that mean for the non-expert? It's a way of reducing vertices in the graph. So you go from say M vertices to M to the point nine vertices. You reduce vertices. So you're working with a smaller problem. You can do it more efficiently. You don't, you don't have to sample these trees at every level, every time. So I will skip the details because we're out of time. Uh, you, so one key piece is vertex reduction. A second key piece is edge reduction. And we need to build a spanner. Like you have lots of edges. You can go work on a sparser graph. Uh, so vertex reduction, edge reduction. And we are able to sort of layer them to give an efficient data structure. Uh, let me, sorry about, sorry, I didn't intend to flash these slides. Uh, uh, here, here's maybe just one picture I am okay with showing you. So you start with your graph at the top. We will have lots of low stretch trees uh, that will allow you to do vertex reduction. These are called core, like you sort of shrink. You go from M, M uh, sorry, you go from N vertices to N to the point nine vertices on each of these G by FIs. In these smaller graphs, you can do edge reduction by using spanners, and now you repeat. So you have multiple layers of this data structure. What is the guarantee you get? The guarantee you get is that at least one of these paths in the data structure can find you an efficient cycle, one of these paths. So, so it gives you, as I said, a collection of trees, and at least one of the trees will have a good solution, and you can find it fast. Uh, but let me not show you how, let me just, sorry about this. Uh, let me conclude, sorry for going a bit over time. So we, we give an algorithm to solve maximum flow, main cost flow and general convex flows in almost linear time. Our algorithm has two essential ingredients, one L1 IPM that reduces it to an almost linear number of mean ratio cycle problems that you only need to solve approximately. And two, we can give a dynamic data structure that solves these each of these problems in a small amount of amortized time. And that gives you an almost linear time algorithm for the entire data, entire problem. Thank you.